Hi everyone, my name is Christina. I work at the UCLA Career Center. Welcome everybody to the Osteopathic Medicine DO Jumpstart. Um, the Career Center presents these type of workshops to help students understand the application process of various professional schools related to pre-health. Today we're gonna talk to six osteopathic medicine programs and this is the agenda for the event. So I will finish talking soon. And then I will give the floor over to Sim, which is a student organization at UCLA. And their, uh, their uh, presenters will talk about their organization and what they do. Then we have six schools, Rocky Vista, Burrell, Norda, Western University, Pacific Northwest, California Health Sciences, to talk about their programs. Um, just a couple of quick events. So if you are still planning um, to study for your MCAT, we have three MCAT workshops coming up in the near future. The near meaning, the next one is tomorrow on Wednesday and it's presented by Altius. And then we have two Princeton review workshops. One is a strategy session and the other one is actually a practice test that if you sign up for, you have access to the practice test for three full months. So you don't have to take it on Saturday, but students prefer to have a day that they can look forward to. So that's why we give a date. And just very quickly, a very brief overview of how the Career Center offers pre-med resources and services. We have, of course, online things um, like the UCLA Pre-Health at UCLA website, Pre-Health at UCLA Facebook page. Um, counseling workshops, you can uh, sign up for pre-health counseling through your Handshake account. They are 30 minute appointments and they are available Monday through Friday. New appointments are posted every Friday between two and four. We also have pre-health drop-ins on Fridays between 12 and one, and you can find the link on the pre-health website. And you have pre-med pre-health workshops just like this and the MCAT workshops every quarter on various topics. You can also sign up for a newsletter that goes out bi-weekly, fall, winter, and spring quarters. Um, all you need to do is select healthcare as one of your industry preferences and you will be receiving it automatically. If you no longer want to receive it, you can always opt out. Uh, we have recorded pre-med pre-health webinars just like this one. It's going to be recorded and eventually posted on the YouTube channel. So this is something to consider because you will see a lot of great uh, recorded workshops on various topics. And that is all I had. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to ask Sanjana to take it over and talk about SIM. Okay, to start off, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, hi, my name is Sanjana. I am a second year neuroscience major at UCLA. And so here I'm gonna present about SIM or Students for Integrative Medicine. So what is integrative medicine? Does anyone know? You can put it in chat. Okay, so integrative medicine. Oops, okay, so integrative medicine is a combination between two types of medicines. So one is allopathic medicine, which is modern medicine that is uh, mainly used in hospitals and in healthcare industries. So that could be things such as surgery, anesthetics, chemicals, uh, vaccines, pharmaceuticals, things like that. And so allopathic medicine mainly focuses on acute illnesses and usually compartmentalizes organ systems and focuses on uh, treating symptoms. Meanwhile, uh, complementary and alternative medicine, also called CAM, focuses on a whole person holistic point of view. So they focus on both the mind, body, and spirit connections. And so um, some types in, or some treatments that CAM does is um, related to lifestyle habits, things to lower your risk of diseases, self-care, and things like that. And so in CAM, there are five pillars. So one is the whole medical systems, which um, is basically things like homeopath uh, homeopathy, neutropathy, Ayurveda, traditional Chinese medicine. Then the second pillar is called mind-body medicine, which focuses on yoga and mindfulness. The third one is biological medicine. So herbs, vitamins, foods, things related to diet. 
Um, fourth pillar is manipulative and body-based practices. So that can be things such as um, massage therapy, chiropractors, osteopathic manipulations. And the fifth pillar is energy medicine. So things such as feng shui, reiki, things like that. And so integrative medicine is basically when both of these types are combined. So um, while modern medicine focuses on symptoms, evidence-based CAM medicine focuses on a whole person approach. So by fix or by um, combining these two, integrative medicine seeks to fix the problem rather than temporarily alleviate the symptoms or the pain. So one example could be if, for example, if uh, let's say one person has injured their leg, uh, they may get surgery, they may get pain medication, but they'll also get physical therapy, sometimes acupuncture and things such as that. So that combination is called integrative medicine. Hi, everyone. Joanna George here, uh, one of the membership director for SIM. Uh, we as a club, what we do is not get you as students involved in integrative medicine. We bring in uh, professionals who are uh, very good at like who have been practicing naturopathy, homeopathy, Ayurveda, all these different things into school and they will teach you what they do. They'll teach you some practices you can keep in your daily life and just things like that. Um, next slide, please. So another thing we do actually, like not just these professional led workshops, but we also have uh, a partnership with Yosan and University so you guys as students can go in person and learn traditional Chinese medicine. We also give you guys a chance to teach um, other students about uh, integrative medicine through these wellness fairs, you know, and through different programs that we run on campus itself. Uh, these are a couple of events we have done in the past. The mentorship is something that we definitely have sort of already gone through this medical journey and, and like are like already getting into their graduate school business and things like that. Uh, but also just uh, this helps like build a connection for you, especially as young students in school on, on campus. And then other things like the fairs that, uh, that you get to teach, you get to partner with other uh, wellness and integrative medicine groups on campus to really just emphasize this whole health care, uh, whole body care that, we, uh, that SIM is all about. Some more things that we've done. These are other, uh, another thing that we're doing next week or this Thursday, actually, if you guys are interested to come out, integrative dermatology. I know it does sound a little interesting. What can dermatology be? It, it, how, what can dermatology have to do with, you know, all these different uh, integrative medicine types, but you'd be really surprised if all of you are welcome to come, uh, non-SAM students, everybody included. This is 6 to 7 p.m. Thursday in MS 3915D. And so the following weeks, we also have a few other workshops. Oh, and then so, these are oh sorry. So um, week six, we have art therapy. Week seven, music therapy. Week eight, we have trauma-based yoga. And we're partnering up with RISE um, at UCLA. And then week 10, we're doing nutrition and gut microbiome. And so um, here are, are some of our websites and Facebook links and Instagram links if you're ever interested in joining or getting more information. And so now um, we can open it up to a few questions. If any of you have questions, please be sure to put it in the chat or the Q&A Q &A, and I will uh, do my best to answer them all. Thank you so much, both of you. And uh, if you guys have, if the, any of the students have any questions about SIM, I just put in the, your Facebook page in the chat so you guys can see what SIM is all about. Feel free to post questions in the Q&A or chat and we will be here to answer. Next up is Rocky Vista University. So Anthony, please take it over. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Pleasure to be here. It is my esteemed pleasure to represent Rocky Vista University College of Medicine as Anthony Walls, admissions counselor extraordinaire to the Stars and Beyond. I'm also joined by one of our fantastic students and my counterpart, Charlotte Hurst. So 
everybody probably will hear about similar descriptions on how what qualifications we're looking for for requirements to get into our osteopathic medical school. So we do offer three programs, DO, PA, and MSBS, which is the Master of Biomedical Sciences, the Physician Assistant, as well as the Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine. The advantage to you is that while you guys are attending your undergrad university, you are able to matriculate into, you'll be able to apply and everything has to be done by the time you matriculate. So if you are a rising senior, you're going to graduate in May. No worries there. As long as you have that degree in hand by July, we'll be able to get you into the comm. From there, we do have to have a minimum 3.0 of both minimum uh, cumulative GPA as well as science GPA. And it's a 2.6 for the MSBS program. And while we do accept the GRE, MCAT, PCAT, DAT, any of those advanced kind of exams for entrance, we typically advise to, if you know you want to go into osteopathic medicine, take the MCAT. It's going to help you further down the road. And we do have prerequisite courses that most pre-meds and biology and chemistry degrees have already knocked out. But if you have any questions about any of this at all, um, you can contact Charlotte or myself or just generally admissions at rvu.edu. And... Uh, we do review our, your application holistically. So what that looks like for us, is, of course, um, we have the six little areas that we look at. We can't consider your application if it doesn't meet the minimum requirements per our accreditation. But uh, once you've met that 3.0 in both categories, you have an MCAT score. We do not have a minimum, but our competitive MCAT is a 506. And then we look at your coursework. How did you perform academically? We look at consistency to make sure, you know, everything looks right. Clinical experiences, we always, we do accept research, but we do want that hands-on clinical experience more so than research experience. Service is one of our core mission values. We want to make sure that you give back to the community and you know what it looks like to serve others and have a servant's heart. And then letters of rec, uh, we have three. Letter of choice can be anybody. Please don't submit uh, your mom or your aunt to write a recommendation letter for you. Um, from there, we have a academic letter that can be an academic advisor as well as a basic science faculty if your school does not have a committee letter. And then the third would be a healthcare letter. And that's the one that typically is the most difficult because it does not need to be a DO or an MD but those are the strongest. And what we're looking for is someone that can speak to your clinical experience. So someone that has supervised you in a clinical setting that is a healthcare provider. So that can be dentists, nurses, um, EMTs, anything that is anyone that is providing healthcare experience for you and can directly speak to supervising you is what we're looking for with that. Now, I'm going to turn it over to the person we actually do want to hear from, one of our illustrious students, Laura, to talk about what it looks like to be a DO in the day. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Anthony, for that introduction. So I'm student Dr. Laura Cooper, and I'm a second year at Rocky Vest University on the Colorado campus. I moved to Colorado from Georgia, where I have spent almost my whole life, and I completed the Master's of Science in Biomedical Sciences program at RVU before beginning my first year of medical school. I'm absolutely loving our views so far. I really enjoy the setup of the systems courses in first and second year. It was super nice to establish a foundation of knowledge in each system before moving into this year where I'm learning all the pathology, pharmacology, and clinical aspects of all of those systems. The two-year-long courses for both first and second year, principles of clinical medicine and osteopathic principles and practice has been extremely rewarding. I get excited on the weeks I have these labs because the principles of clinical medicine class really makes me feel like a real doctor since I get to have the opportunity to practice physical exam skills and interact with the standardized patients. Osteopathic principles and practice has been a very fun lab so far. It's incredible how much we learn about the human body and how to treat ailments based on osteopathic diagnosis and treatment using just our hands. On a typical week, we will have lab on Mondays and Thursdays for an hour and a half each. Each day during the week, there are lectures scheduled for the systems courses, and the time commitment for each lecture ranges from about 30 minutes to three hours. The lecture delivery is mostly virtual with a mix of video lectures and live Zoom lectures. However, depending on the course, professors will host an in-person live lecture on campus that will be recorded. 
I wanted to mention also that I'm in the physician scientist track at RVU. In this track, we get to learn more about the research process and how it impacts our future patients and have started on a few projects relating to specialties I am interested in. This track is one of many that RVU offers to enrich our education and makes RVU very special to us. I'm excited to put all the knowledge I've learned thus far to use in the future, and I'm so thankful for the encouragement and positive influence everyone at RVU has had on me. Go Prairie Dogs. Please let me know if you have any questions for me. Terrific. Thank you so much, Laura. So we burned through a lot of that really quickly, but basically we do have that osteopathic, we choose to follow those do it, do as the DOs do. So that's a weird sentence to say, but of course we practice um, our full body. So of course the physical, mental, and emotional health. We have therapy dogs on Mondays and Fridays. We also do lots of different kind of one-off events. Um, we plant succulents for wellness. We kind of have this gorgeous illustrious space behind me for outdoor activities. Um, most of the time there's like a taco truck or snow cones over here. So we try to get our students outside of the building. Everything at RVU is meant to further their education, but also take care of their mental health. We do have 24 seven counseling available on all of our campuses. And as Laura said, we do have a system, a modified systems approach. So you'll spend several weeks on one system and that will include your lab, lecture, exams, SIMS, everything during that block will be located around that area of the body. And then by the time you're in your second year preparing for your boards, you've been through each system twice. One as it's working normally to learn the structure of it, and then the second time to learn how it acts when it's being abnormal. Um, that way, by the time you practice for your boards, you're more than prepared. You've got the OMM skills to back you up, and you start to feel, as Laura said, like a real doctor uh, very early on in the curriculum. Um, everything we do is important for you because we want to make sure that we are fostering a compassionate environment for you to be a compassionate DO physician. The tracks supplement all of that. So once you get into the curriculum after your first semester, you'll be in the curriculum and you'll be able to elect to um, go into one of those tracks and those tracks will give you the opportunity to go into a focused area of medicine that you would prefer. Because in Colorado, we have Denver just about 30 minutes away from us. So that's going to look a lot different than if you want to be a rural doc for 500 people in a, a small town. So whatever focus you want, RVU is here to support you and make sure that you are the kind of physician you'd like to be. But we want to take, uh, tailor our experiences to you to make sure that you get to be the physician that you want to be. Of course, uh, some of you have probably heard we have absolutely fantastic match rating as well as um, we get the residencies that you want. Um, and last year alone, I think we got two of the dermatology spots for our residencies. So we can obviously get you into that field that you'd like if that's what you're interested in. Charlotte, do you have any thoughts? Nothing to add. Thank you. So now if you guys have any questions, we can save you a couple minutes on um, uh, your evening, but um, we are always available at admissions at rvu.edu. And um, we are, the best part of our job is interacting with you before, during, and after your medical school curriculum. So we're, I'd say we're here 24 seven, but we do take some time off. Um, but if you have any questions about application, what it looks like to attend RVU, we do in-person campus tours um, all the way, like we do them every, every two weeks typically. And then we will also be hosting some of our virtual events as well um, coming up in the next couple months. Thank you so much. And again, I just want to remind students that you can ask questions on in the Q&A and you can put them in the chat as well. And hopefully uh, we get some good questions. I have one. Um, how flexible are you on letters of recommendation? Because I know a lot of our UCLA students are a little bit worried about not being able to, you know, gather letters of recommendation sometimes uh, for, you know, the COVID reasons and um, other things. A lot of their classes for the past couple of years were online. So I just want to know how, because you mentioned you have, you need three letters. So um, how it, is there any flexibility on, I know not mom and aunt, but what is the flexibility there? 
That is a great question. So um, a lot of the times what we do is we have several of us in admissions that go over letters and we go through everything from the signature all the way at the top, all the way to the bottom of the letter. I guarantee you, we not only read everything you submit, but every painstaking character of your letters of recommendation because that's important to us. So for each letter, there is some wiggle room. So for the letter of choice, that's up to you. Uh, it can be a previous supervisor. It can be someone that you've um, you've worked with, not in a clinical setting, but someone that can speak to your character and your strengths. Academic, we are able to accept academic advisors, basic science faculty who have supervised you, whether virtual or in person. And then um, most of the time, we do realize that COVID-19 did cause a lot of um, capabilities for our students to get really expert level letters of rec virtually. Um, we do accept all of those uh, instances where someone was affected by COVID-19. Um, of course, some of the letters we read are, um, I've gotten to know this student as best as you can through a computer screen. So we're not just gonna throw out a COVID-19 letter. Um, so we are very flexible. And basically what we're looking for is someone that can say, this person was in my classroom. I've seen them. They perform academically well. As long as there's no red flags that said, yeah, this person never showed up to class, we're going to be able to count that towards an academic letter. And as far as the healthcare letter, we do accept any of those healthcare providers. It can be a dentist. It can be a pharmacist. Um, anyone that has provided healthcare for our students um, in that clinical setting is the hardest part, though. Um, we realize, especially in COVID-19, physical in-person shadowing, as well as opportunities in clinical settings have been severely limited and diminished. So we want to make sure that, you know, even if it's virtual shadowing, as long as that doctor can say, yes, they, they've scribed for me, they were a medical assistant. Typically, what we don't want, even though it's a very noble and helpful routine, is letters that say, um, this person volunteered in the ER department and they restock blankets. While that is absolutely exceptional work for your patients, we need someone to illustrate what you've done with your patients, taking patient histories, um, being in the room with the patients, listening to some of the diagnoses. That's why that clinical experience is so important for the application. So with that, we can accept CNAs, see our CNAs, any of the kind of credentials that you would see in a normal hospital. Um, the only downside is that we need it to be supervised. So it can't just be, I work alongside of them. It's a great question in the chat. Um, being a family caretaker, it's not the strongest experience. It will, we will be able to consider that as experience that will benefit your application. Um, we do want it to be more in a clinical setting, such as a structured healthcare environment. Um, and then typically just to wrap that up with a pretty little bow, it does not have to be a DO or an MD, it could uh, be any healthcare provider. And if you have questions about all of that, we do too. So you can always email us at any time. And the last recommendation I can make on that is ACOMAS lets you submit six letters. So if you submit three automatically, give us time to review those letters and then let us make sure those requirements are met before you submit the other three. If you want to submit five, that's fine. Um, I know a lot of schools have similar letter requirements, but um, we want to make sure that you don't cap out at six letters and not be able to submit a sixth one. We're only able to consider letters that are uploaded through a COMAS. Thank you so much for all that. One more question. Are you hosting interviews in person or virtually? Absolutely fantastic question. So for the current cycle, we are virtually interviewing over Zoom. Um, virtual interviews are 40 minutes with two interviewers. So you and your two interviewers in a breakout room for 40 minutes. Um, it's more conversational as opposed to um, geared towards academics, because at that point, you've already been screened for your academics. So it's just more of a good fit and a character interview than anything. Thank you. So anybody else has any questions for um, Anthony or Charlotte or Laura, please make sure that you post it in the Q&A or chat. And for time's sake, we're going to move on to the next school, which is Burrell. Uh, so Austin, 
feel free to take it over. And thank you again for Rocky Vista for being here. I learned a lot. I know what to say to my students now. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Austin Gentry. I'm the Director of Recruitment here at Burrell College Osteopathic Medicine. I'm going to share my screen with you all so you can see my presentation. Let me get that pulled up real quick. Okay, so at the Burrell College Osteopathic Medicine, I really thought it'd be best to cover a little bit about who we are as an institution, uh, some of how the resources we provide to our students and the programs that we actually offer, um, and then wrapping it up with kind of the admissions process and what we're looking at for our specific campus. So we're very, very much a uh, mission-focused school. When we're looking at everything we do, uh, everything revolves around our mission. It's for the people in the future. And so at our college, we're dedicated to improving the health of the southwestern United States and its border with northern Mexico through culturally respectful undergraduate and graduate and continuing osteopathic medical education, research, and its support of clinical service to the community. Our vision is that we're focused on increasing diversity in the physician workforce and fostering a practice of lifelong learning, compassion, respect, and excellence in our students. Uh, if you're not familiar, we are located in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And so we are located about 45 minutes away from the U.S.-Mexican border, right outside of El Paso. Uh, really great area, um, very diverse area. And so our students get a lot of experience working in multiple types of communities that we can offer here throughout their education. So during a student's first and second year, uh, it's going to be typical of most programs where we're doing that lecture style um, didactic, uh, or sorry, uh, lecture style in person uh, options. We do have recorded sessions as well. You can see one of my first year classes here in the first year room. Um, we, they go through case discussions, team-based learning, lab and skill instructions, a simulated clinical experience uh, is all done through our instruction. We also have hands-on curriculum. So our standardized patient encounter and skills training, that takes place very early on. Uh, I am newer to the institution and I kind of figured the uh, standard patient encounters would take place probably a student's second semester in school. Uh, on our campus, they actually start their student or their standardized patient encounters starting their third week of their education. I, I was shocked to see that because I was like, well, what have they learned so far they can really be applying? And we start with the basics, the basic interaction with the people who are you are actually meeting with and then honing those skills throughout their time on campus. We also have our high fidelity simulations and clinical skills practice area. Uh, Art, who runs our sim lab, he makes his own skin for sutures. He cuts it up and we do suture clinics, stop the bleed classes. Uh, we have a gal who is as our adult male patient and all these different patients that our students get hands-on applications with before going into their clinical setting. We have hybrid human anatomy laboratory with both uh, physical patients and then digital patients as well. Osteopathic manipulated medicine, we just redid that space to better suit our services, our students. We do offer pass-fail grading, um, and essentially the reason why we do that is because that's what some of your later tests look like. And so we do, we are able to go ahead and report which quartile you fall into uh, in any letters when you're looking at residencies. On campus, we offer a lot of support to our students. And I would note one very important thing about our school is we only offer one degree. Um, we only offer a doctor of osteopathic medicine. And because we do that, it allows us to be very highly focused on our students. We have advisory colleges and faculty advisors through our warm advising program. We have our OMS2 mentors or the bigs on campus that help mentor those first year students who are a little bit nervous about taking their first exam. Faculty and student tutoring, learning specialists, library services, mental health services, and of course, board prep. One of the important things I think we offer as an institution is during a test day, for instance, uh, we actually have our learning specialists and other people from student affairs hanging out outside the classroom for when that test is done. If someone's a little bit nervous about how they did, they're there to kind of comfort them and walk them through it. They provide snacks and stuff to kind of ease everybody uh, as they're going through the difficult process of taking those exams. So after a student's first two years, we do do our clerkship rotations. Uh, you can see a few different areas we do it in. Uh, the first would be Las Cruces. So if you are familiar with the state of New Mexico, we're right down there in the bottom south end. We also have 
uh, Eastern New Mexico, Albuquerque, Four Corners, El Paso, Texas, Tucson, Arizona, and Rockledge, Florida. One of the things I like to highlight about our clinical and clerkship rotations is that we do have some rural track options for our students. Uh, some students are interested in rural medicine, and rural medicine is really needed out there because there's not as many physicians serving in those communities, and we have those clerkship opportunities. The benefit to you as students, if you were to attend Burrell, is that we are able to provide you a little bit more hands-on applications than in some bigger cities. With these clerkships, you might be it might just be you and the doctor in the, the room. And so the doctor will rely heavily on your skills that you've learned at Burrell to help work with patients. We've heard some pretty amazing stories from students coming out of our clinical rotations. Uh, but one of the things we hear from the physicians is our students come in not only very professional, but very well prepared to do the hands-on skills they need to do because of the training they received on our campus. So we have a few distinction programs. Uh, the first would be a directed human dissection. Uh, this happens between a student's first and second year during the summer. They must be in good academic standing, very important, but this includes a whole body dissection, clinical imaging, and other topics determined by our anatomy faculty. Uh, this distinction program is great if you want to get a little bit more hands-on. Uh, they're the ones who are preparing the bodies to be worked on throughout the year, and so they accept them in and they work through them to get them prepped for the next year's students. The next distinction program we offer is in research. It's a faculty-driven research in basic biomedical science, clinical science, population, public health, and medical education. There's two paths a student can take. There's either a summer research program um, and they do a medical student research day where they present everything they found during their summer or a longitudinal distinction in research pathway if students are a little bit more interested in doing the, the long-term research program. The last distinction program that we do offer for our students is in rural medicine, and this one is near and dear to my heart. Um, I, we really need more physicians in the rural area, and so that's what we can provide at Burrell. Uh, this is open to qualified medical students in their third year serving in two of our rural regional academic centers. The goal of the program is to empower students to engage with and solve the unique challenges in the healthcare practice among rural and underserved populations. Uh, students must complete special required projects during their third year rotations. This is a huge advantage for students when they are applying for their um, uh, rotations and they're done with school and they're looking for residency. It really allows them to have a leg up on the competition. Even if you're not interested in serving in a rural community long term, Having this can really help open your eyes to what medicine can offer in, in various settings um, where there's really a need for medical professionals uh, out in rural communities. So in synopsis, here, here's what we prepare you to do. Uh, we do this by providing curriculum and practice for a competitive environment. Uh, we all know how competitive residencies are. Our numbers are on our website. I encourage you to go check those out. Um, we is very, very high in multiple programs. Also, multiple areas of to match your field of interest. Um, some students might think, well, DOs can only do internal medicine or primary care. That's not true. We've had students match in multiple different especially practices. Also, opportunities to work with underserved populations in a rural envi environment. Whether that's what you want to do long term or not, you really get a good glimpse and insight into uh, what that looks like on our campus. Skills that will transfer to all disciplines and holistic preparation for future practice. So the thing I wanna end with today is just a little bit about uh, our admissions process itself. Um, so for students coming in, we do require a science GPA of at least a 3.0 and an MCAT score of a 496 is our minimum. Now, of course, we do see averages higher than that um, when we're looking at our incoming class. Uh, I was just at a fair over in UC Davis uh, this last week and I heard a lot of students who were surprised that they could still apply for this next um, upcoming cycle. Yes, you can. Um, the applications open and that's not super rare that multiple schools here would probably attest to our applications are open. And so if you're working through your MCAT and getting all those things in now, we encourage you to apply as soon as possible through a COMIS and that way you can get that process started. Uh, we all have supplemental applications you're going to have to submit as well. And so the sooner you can do that, the better you are off uh, in looking at your um, potential DO degree. 
On our campus, uh, we do have a lot of support services for our students. And one of the things that we do is in the admissions office. And so we do offer tours uh, basically all year round. I, I make the joke and it's half joking, but someone's gonna call me on this one of these days. If you are on our campus at 2 a.m. on a Saturday night, I will be there. Um, I will figure it out. We will make sure it is staffed. I, I know we're in an, a unique location where people aren't necessarily just hopping through Las Cruces on a random Wednesday afternoon. So if, if you're going to make the time to stop by, we'll do it. And uh, we really did have a student come by at nine o'clock on a Monday night. And myself and our director of admissions both I met the student there to give a tour. Our, our campus is beautiful. Um, we've had a few graduating classes now because we are a newer school and those graduating classes have gone on to do great things. Um, so at this point we're, we're tried and tested, which I think is important uh, for newer schools and we're very proud of our students. I was hoping to have one of my students come and present. Um, she's a third year student. Unfortunately, she's in her clinical rotations right now and it sounds like she wasn't able to make it here in time from that clinical rotation. So I'm sure she's doing great things. Um, but what I can do is I can provide her information out. Uh, she is from California and she, you all can connect with her at a later date if you have any questions. Uh, I, I always encourage my students to be open and honest. We were in one of our interview sessions and uh, a student asked an interesting question. And I was like, uh oh, how's, how's my student gonna answer this? Cause it was a pretty blunt question and they did a great job but they were honest about it. And that's what we want from our students uh, is to really showcase what we offer as an institution and to not beat around the bush and to show what we highlight um, on our campus. So I will take questions. Um, I will also drop in my contact information into the chat. If you do have questions, uh, you can use the Q&A function. If you do want more information about our institution, please go to that link I just dropped in, burrell.edu slash info. That'll get you connected with us. I'm honest with what you're signing up for. It is only five emails over five weeks. That's it. I'm not going to bombard you every morning at 5 a.m. I promise we'll make it nice and simple so you can get to know a little bit more about our program. But I'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Thank you, Austin. And students, feel free to ask your questions because if you don't, I will and I am not looking to apply, so please feel free to ask questions. Sanjana, feel free to ask questions too if you want. You can even unmute yourself. Actually, you know what? I'm going to give voices to our students too. Maybe that's going to prompt some questions since we are a small group today. We can talk. Now you have voices, so now you have three options, Q&A, raise your hands, chat, so feel free to ask questions. So I'm going to ask the same question from you, Austin, and also, um, how are your interviews, in-person, virtual? So our interviews are uh, virtual. Um, one of the things we found after the pandemic is that requiring students to pay sometimes a couple thousand dollars to travel all across the nation to show up to schools is, is not great. Um, it's not a great look. Um, and so we have decided to stay virtual. And, and to be honest, at first, I was not too pleased with that because I like the in-person component. Um, I've been very pleased to see that our virtual uh, experience is very engaging for our students. And so there are multiple facets they go through throughout the day. Um, one does include a live interview um, with some individuals from our campus. Thank you. Any other questions? I can't believe we keep on time. So that's awesome. So if you think of any questions, feel free to drop it in chat um, or in the Q&A. We're going to move on to Norda. And I'm inviting Kristen Anderson for um, Norda College of Osteopathic Medicine to present her program. Oh. All right, can you all hear me? 
Okay, I'm, I'm dealing with a cold right now, so I'm hoping my voice is going to hold up. I've been talking to students all day, so <laughs> here we go. All right, so my name is Kristen Anderson. I am the Assistant Dean for Student Affairs at the Nordic College of Osteopathic Medicine, and thank you for inviting us to, to participate in this um, event. We're happy to be here. So we get a lot of questions. Why Norda? Where, where the heck did that name come from? What is Norda? Um, and Norda, the Norda family is actually a local family in our area. Um, who gave a large grant to uh, the, or the Ray and Ty Norda Foundation, gave a large grant to our institution to get things kind of up and running. And as part of that, they helped shape our guiding principles, which the, the number one guiding principle being that students come first. And they had some kind of stipulations that came along with um, giving this grant money to us. And that one of those was that uh, tuition not increase once a student starts. So we do have locked tuition, which is pretty unique. You don't, you don't see that everywhere. Um, so what you pay in your first year for tuition is what you're going to pay in your last year for tuition. Um, so that's a little bit about why Norda. Um, for those of you who don't know, we are a newer school. Um, I think the newest school on here. Um, and we are located in Provo, Utah, uh, which is about 45 minutes south of Salt Lake City, the, the state's capital. Um, and we are closely located, we're right off the freeway, the Interstate 15 um, high freeway that runs north and south through the state. Um, so we're conveniently located right off of the freeway. It's a, a quick drive up to, to Salt Lake City if you want to get into, you know, bigger city. We're about uh, 15, 20 minutes away from the mountains. So uh, lots of access to recreational activities and um, camping, fishing, hiking, uh, you know, mountain biking, rock climbing, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and um, we did receive um, pre-accreditation status from COCA, our accrediting body, in um, December of 2020. And we are on track to, to um, receive full accreditation on time, which um, for those of you who don't know, all new schools um, have to enter in pre-accreditation status before they get full accreditation. And we will be eligible for full accreditation when our, um, about the time our first class graduates, our inaugural class in um, 2025. <clears throat> so a little bit about what makes Nordicom unique is um, we're, we've uh, kind of taken medical education and flipped it on its head. The, the bulk of our curriculum is delivered uh, via pre-recorded videos uh, that, that's kind of delivered in chunks. Our students work on um, two-week cycles and get the videos for the content that they you know, are going over that week, um, week by week, and uh, they work in pods. We call them pods or small groups, um, and it's kind of self-directed learning, group-based learning. They have access to faculty. Um, we have a lot of questions about that. Okay, if you're doing videos and working with your groups, do you, do you have access to faculty? And you do. Uh, faculty who have content that is live, if you will, at that time, are can be found roaming around the, the study rooms, which we also call pods, um, and they're available on, we utilize a, an app called Pronto, uh, and they're available from early in the morning to late at night, and the nice thing is that um, each course has a Pronto channel, if you will, and so maybe a, a pod is in a uh, meeting in the morning and they have a question about something related to the content. And then a different pod group has the same question at five o'clock in the afternoon, in the evening, they can see that um, and, and have kind of the, a, a transcript of all the questions and answers that were asked throughout the day um, and actually throughout the entire course. Um, we have early clinical exposure, uh, utilizing that um, kind of that was mentioned earlier, standardized patients in the first year. In the first year, our students are trained as scribes. Uh, so then they, in their second year, will actually be out in the hospitals and clinics serving as, serving as scribes uh, and getting some good early clinical exposure that way. And then um, we do have simulation facilities and um, you know, utilize the OSCEs and, and that sort of thing. Um, wellness is baked into our curriculum as well. So we have uh, within those uh, video modules, there are some wellness modules that'll pop up. So maybe they're in the middle of a, a tough structure and function 
a section and we know that they're going to be ready to pull their hair out, we'll, we'll pop in a little uh, meditation video or something for them to work through together with their pod group, um, just to kind of get them to, to chill out a little bit. Um, and we have uh, wellness activities all the time there. I mean, we have so many activities that if, if somebody attended all of them, they wouldn't have time to study. Um, and so we have yoga, uh, somebody teaching yoga on campus uh, several times a month. We have um, sound baths. We bring in massage therapists from time to time. Uh, we have access to 24 seven counseling. And then we also have two contracted therapists that work with our students um, on campus. We host uh, diversity panels uh, on various areas. We have a, a religious diversity uh, series that we've been doing the last couple of years where uh, we are actually, or the last, I guess, year and a half now, um, where we highlight different um, religions and, and talk about kind of the, the patient perspective as it pertains to that particular religion that's being discussed and, and things for them to consider as future physicians. Um, and then also kind of along the lines of, of faculty support, each of our students is assigned two docents. Um, so if you go to a museum, you're, you have a docent who helps you through the museum. Uh, so we have docents who are gonna help our students through medical school. And one of them in the uh, biomedical sciences uh, departments and then one from the clinical side. So they can, um, they have that kind of support uh, through both both clinical and the sciences all the way through their uh, four years with us. Um, research is built into our curriculum and then we also have an um, additional optional research track uh, that um, students can opt to participate in. And our goal is to have every one of our students graduate with at least one publication. And we actually have a student in their second year who is has several um, publications, presentations, and um, is, you know, working hard on that. Um, another thing I mentioned, the, the pre-recorded videos, so we don't have scheduled classes. You, you're not going to show up in a large lecture hall uh, with a professor, you know, lecturing to you. Uh, rather, like I said, the, the content is delivered via those pre-recorded videos. Uh, labs are scheduled, so students do have to schedule labs, but they get to pick when when they show up for labs. They'll they'll have several options, and then they get to choose, and that allows students who are you know our students are adult learners that they can choose, uh, you know the time that works best for them to come in and study with their pods. They can choose when they want to do their labs, and that allows them the flexibility to maybe hit the slopes in the morning before they come in, or come in and get all their work done, and then they can go home and you know be mom or dad or you know, husband, whatever, in the evening um, and be able to, you know, have a life too. Um, and then one thing that, another thing that's unique is our clinical rotations are all located within 35 miles of our campus. We have um, clinical partners in, uh, we have partnerships with the three largest um, clinical organization or the medical organizations in the area. Uh, and, and our students are able to accomplish their core rotations within 35 miles. We do have um, a couple of rural sites that, that stretch a little bit further out, but it's still about a 35 minute drive because after you hit a certain point south of, of Utah County where we are, the, the um, speed limit goes up so you can still get there in about 35 minutes. Um, not unlike others that have shared here, we do, um, through our admissions process looks pretty much, you know, pretty similar. You apply through ACOMIS, uh, which opens in early May every year. And our uh, primary application deadline is February 1st. And our secondary or supplemental application deadline is March 1st. And you must be a verified applicant prior to our February 1 deadline for, for consideration. And uh, as far as academics go, we do prefer a 500 uh, total MCAT score with 125 uh, subsection scores. That's our preference. We That's not to say that we screen out for that. We actually do review all applications holistically um, and, and minimum 3.0 uh, cumulative and science GPA is preferred. Uh, we do require the uh, completion of all of our prerequisite courses with a C or higher. As was mentioned before, you can apply with some of those outstanding as long as they are completed at the time of matriculation. And we do re also require a bachelor's degree from a regionally accredited institution. Um, we also require letters of recommendation. Uh, our 
our policy or admissions policy is written to require three letters, one from a physician, sorry, uh, one from a physician, preferably osteopathic, uh, but that's not required that they be osteopathic. We will accept a letter from an allopathic physician, um, science faculty or someone who's familiar with your academic work and a pre-medical source, which could be a um, you know, a committee letter, a pre-med advisor, that sort of thing. Uh, in light of the pandemic and, and kind of the ongoing challenges that students have faced with securing letters of recommendation, we're actually only requiring two of the three letters uh, this, this cycle, and I anticipate we're going to probably see that continue into the next uh, cycle as well, uh, just because we know it's been hard to, to make those connections and really get strong letters of recommendation in all areas. So we let students pick which two of the three they want to, to fulfill. And then um, we do also look at, in addition to the academics, academics those non-academic achievements as well and shadowing community service, healthcare experience and, and other extracurricular activities. So this is just kind of a snapshot of what our inaugural class looked like in terms of uh, metrics. Our average accepted MCAT scores of 504 and those average um, science and non-science GPAs sitting close to that 3.03 or 3.3, 3.4 range. Um, and we have a lot of applicants that come from our region and um, those that kind of want to stay in the Intermountain West. In each of our classes, we have our, our second class um, that just matriculated in August and the, these are their metrics. But in each of our classes, we have between 10 and 15 students from California. Um, a large chunk, like I said, come from the region and some obviously from the state of Utah as well. Um, one thing that um, students need to be aware of when applying to Nordicom is that because we do not have full accreditation, we are not able to um, offer title for uh, federal financial aid options. Um, so we do have uh, private lending options that have been secured through Sally May, iHelp, and Zions Bank. And we're actually hearing from Christina Twelves, our director of financial aid, that many of our students are actually getting better rates through these private lenders than they often do through, through federal funding. So don't let the title for the lack of Title IV funding scare you away um, because there are still great options there. And then we actually have a lot of students that are taking advantage of the um, Health Professions Scholarship Program. We currently in our first two classes have a combined uh, 33 students participating in HPSB in the various branches. Um, and then we have two recipients of the um, National Health Service Corps Scholarship as well. So lots of options that way. And then I'll just leave up our contact information here. Uh, we are on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. You can reach us at admissions at nordicom.org if you have questions. Um, and we can, you know, hop on a call if we need, schedule an appointment to answer any questions you might have. Then I'll go ahead and open it up to questions if anyone has any here today. Thank you very much for the presentation. Christian, I'm sorry about your cold. I hope you're gonna feel better soon. Um, is there any questions from students? Anybody has any questions? So letters of recommendation is obviously in everybody's mind because that's the number one question or the only question that we got. So any comments from your school about letters of rec? Um, as I mentioned, we do typically require the three, but because of the challenges that folks are facing with getting those letters, we are very flexible with, um, you know, the letters that we will accept. We do prefer two of the three uh, that that I mentioned, the, the physician letter, which again can be a DO or an MD, um, the science faculty, and then the um, advising uh, resource, pre-med resource. Any other questions? If not, I'm gonna thank you so much for the presentation. If the questions are coming, it's gonna be in the Q&A or chat and I'm gonna let you know if we have any. And I wanna give Christina Lee a little time to introduce herself because she got here just in the nick of time. So I just wanna give Christina the chance to talk a little bit about um, her experience. Hello, um, my name is Christina. I'm a third year medical student at Burel. 
Um, and I'm also actually from Los Angeles, so I kind of know the area quite a, um, quite, quite a bit. I did visit quite a lot of my friends at UCLA. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit of my experience as a BCom student and what made me want to come here. Um, the one thing I really loved about Burel, I don't know if people still get to do interviews in person, but my experience is during the interview is what kind of made me want to come to BCom. Um, so even during the interview, um, a lot of the second and third years were going through exams. And even though they were going through exams, like they actually made time to like come into the interview day and talk to us and share their experience and answer any questions that we had. And I feel like not only the friendliness, like within Burel, mm, kind of like came with like an open arm, but I realized that also the faculty and the staff are also like very friendly. And I feel like that it's something very important for you to be able to survive medical school is having that support system. And I feel like wherever you guys end up going, it's it's definitely based on what you make of your experience. So I feel like everyone should try to go with like open-minded and open heart, I would say. Thank you very much for sharing your um, insights into Burrell's experience. We are very thankful that you made it here from your rotation. Sorry, yeah. No, it's okay, perfect. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to our students. If you have any questions for Christina, please put it in the Q&A or the chat, and I'm sure she will be happy to answer any questions you may have. And to um, our next presenter is Western University. So Christopher, please feel free to take it over. Thanks, Hi. Christina. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Christopher Vu. Let me share my PowerPoint here really quickly. Okay, is it showing up on everyone's screen? Yes? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, so yes, my name is Christopher Vu. I am the admissions counselor here for Western University of Health Sciences. Uh, I am the counselor or recruiter for the Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine program, as well as the Doctor of Podiatric Medicine program. Um, and thank you so much for taking your time out today to uh, uh, watch and listen to all of our presentations. I really appreciate it a lot. I will leave my contact information at the end of the presentation for you to reach out to me if you have any uh, private questions or anything. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, and just like um, Kristen, I am recovering from COVID. <laughs> so excuse me if I let out a, a cough or two here. Um, I just wanted to start off by going over um, a little bit of the history of Western University. We were founded back in 1977 as the College of Osteopathic Medicine of the Pacific by Dr. Philip Pumerantz. Um, he founded Western University, based it in Pomona, California, because he actually wanted our focus, our primary focus, to be on humanism and serving underserved and underprivileged communities. Um, in 1996, we actually uh, restructured and renamed ourselves to Western University of Health Sciences, which is what we are known today, in order to offer a more uh, wide spectrum of health sciences to the public and to students that wish to learn. Um, in 2006, about a decade after, we actually founded the College of Podiatric Medicine, which is one of the uh, one of our kind of newer programs here at Western University. And then present day, we have over uh, well, it's a little bit over 3,800 enrolled students now between nine colleges and 27 different programs. <clears throat> Excuse me. So why should you choose Western University? We actually have one, or we are, we actually have one of the most uh, robust interprofessional education programs, which is one of the programs at Western University that allows our students to uh, learn to collaborate with other specialties and other health sciences, um, because all nine of our different colleges participate in our interprofessional education program, we are considered one of the biggest and one of the most robust IPE programs in the country. Um, our students have also developed 100, over, well, over 130 uh, clubs and organizations in order to um, promote any sort of hobbies or any sort of uh, community outreach that you may be interested in. So chances are if uh, there's a certain type of population that you would wish to work with or any of your hobbies that you may have, um, chances are we will have a club for it. We also have our patient care center on campus. So it is one of our rotation sites that you can rotate through. But our 
patient care center was developed in order to, you know, serve uh, Pomona and uh, the surrounding cities, um, and essentially targeting the underserved and underpopulated or underrepresented populations around the city and around the uh, cities that surround us. Um, we do have two campuses. One of our campuses is in Lebanon, Oregon, which focuses more on rural health, whereas our Pomona, California campus focuses more under on the underserved and underrepresented populations. Um, we do have a slew of longitudinal tracks as well, with um, the po more popular ones being our longitudinal care, uh, chronic care track, and then our health justice and equity track. So those are the ones that I have found that students most resonate with and the ones that they would like to participate in the most. And last but not least, uh, our collaborative environment provides students opportunities to study not only in our IPE program, but also in large group and small group studies. So essentially, we like to see our students getting together and studying together and, you know, being able to do things together rather than, you know, sitting in a dorm or sitting at home and doing um, their studies by themselves. <clears throat> um, our on-campus housing, which is called the Damier, we actually have um, three different floor plans for you to choose from if you are not from the, around the area and you do need housing on campus. Um, the Damier does have studio plans and as well as one bedroom and two bedroom uh, plans as well. Um, it is a pet friendly uh, housing option. So on the first three floors, we actually do allow pets. But for those of you that have any sort of pet allergies or dander allergies or anything like that, the fourth floor is, re is reserved for um, a pet free environment so that just in case anybody does have any allergies or anything like that, anything like that to animals, you are able to still stay at the dummy. And then, of course, there are other housing options, other apartments around the campus that are within five minutes walking. And um, but those are not Western University sponsored uh, apartments. So there will be, you know, uh, people from the outside populations that will, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that will be residing there. Um, on the screen, you'll also see free laundry, parking, utilities, cable, internet, as well as a 24-hour fitness center in the Damier that is available to anyone that chooses to stay at the Damier. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about our curriculum and our clinical experiences. So obviously, of course, your curriculum will begin in your first year. Um, we utilize a two-pass block style method for our curriculum, where our students learn the entire body twice. So in the first year, you will be uh, working on normal functions of the body, which is your anatomies, your uh, physiologies, and things like that. Um, and so you're, excuse me, you're learning about um, the health and wellness of the body and how the body should function normally. Then the second year, you're learning more about your restorative health. So that would include your microbiomes, your pathologies and things like that. And you're learning about how to restore health to a sick and ailing body. Um, and as well as our osteopathic manipulative treatment courses, uh, we actually begin our students with OMM, OMT practice their very, very first semester at our university. In your third and fourth year, uh, you will be uh, starting with your rotations. So most of our rotations are um, within 45 miles of the campus. So um, more than likely, you will not need to relocate for rotations unless you would choose to do so. Um, so, you know, with LA traffic, the most you'll be traveling is maybe like an hour and a half. Uh, the furthest rotation site, if you do get placed there, would be our, I believe, Santa Maria, which is about two and a half to three miles or two and a half to three hours away. Um, and that one you most likely will need to uh, relocate for, but that's only one location out of all the other rotation sites that we have. Um, most of the majority of our rotations are between four to six weeks with one rotation being 12 weeks, which is internal medicine. So during your third year, you will be having a more ro uh, structured rotation schedule with only about three um, elective rotations. Whereas your fourth year, you only have three required rotations, which is your emergency medicine, uh, your medicine sub internship and your surgery in sub internship. And then your fourth year, you will have um, seven elective rotations that you can choose from. After every single rotation that you do, you do have to come back to uh, campus in order to have didactic weeks. So every single time you complete a rotation, you will come back to campus for didactic week. Um, and then after your rotations are done, you will begin applying for residencies. And I'm sure as all of you know, we have had a DOMD 
uh, residency merger. And at first it was a relatively big concern among my applicant pool. Um, they were wondering, you know, how we would fare with uh, competing with MD students. And ever since the merger, we've actually still maintained a 98 to 100% um, residency placement rate with most of our students placing into family medicine and internal medicine, as well as emergency medicine. And then here is a breakdown of, I believe, 2016, when we hit 100% residency placement rate of all the uh, specialties that our students placed in. Um, all of this information is on our prospective student webpage. So if you do not catch it now, you can definitely uh, view it later on. Um, next, I would like to speak to you about our admissions process. So, <laughs> excuse me. We do require prerequisite courses in order to be uh, in order to apply for our program. Um, we do require you to have at least eight semester units of biology, organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, and physics, as well as six semester units of college level English and a behavioral science. Um, if you ever needed to, for whatever reason, you can uh, go back from semester to quarter by multiplying your semester units by 1.5 or dividing your quarter units by 1.5. Um, the coursework that you see underneath the required prerequisites, which is your biochemistry, microbiology, genetics, immun immunology, anatomy, and physiology, they are more recommended than required, but it does definitely help you boost your application as these are courses that you will be seeing when you are matriculating into medical school. Um, we also do require you to have a bachelor's degree, whether it's a bachelor's in science or a bachelor's in arts, it does not matter. We require you to also have, excuse me, uh, an MCAT score. You can apply without an MCAT score. However, the MCAT must be taken by January of the matriculating year, and it cannot be older than three years old. So how we judge how old the MCAT score is, is by the application year. So for example, this year is the 2022 application year for matriculating in 2023. So you would take the 2022 matriculating year, subtract three years from that, and that's the oldest MCAT score that we would uh, allow you to have. We do require you to have two letters of recommendations. One um, is from a physician, whether it's an MD or a DO, and the other is from a science professor or a pre-health committee letter. Um, because of the COVID pandemic, we actually have a section of our secondary application where if an applicant is not able to procure a physician letter of recommendation because um, you know, shadowing opportunities were scarce or anything or any other reasons that um, you know, have prevented you from obtaining a letter of recommendation from a physician, we allow you to explain that in the secondary application and there's actually a whole separate area for you to explain it. And then the committee will take that into consideration as to whether or not to waive the physician letter of recommendation for your application. Um, so we go through the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine Application Service, or what we call ACOMAS. The primary application is generally open on May 5th. However, that date can fluctuate a little bit depending on if May 5th uh, is on a weekend or not. Um, and then our primary application deadline is <laughs> February 1st. So as long as you submit your application by February 1st, then you're absolutely fine. Um, your secondary application will come after that. The secondary application is selective. Um, our committee does review our applications um, in order to determine not only competitiveness, but whether or not you know, the specific applicant would be able to handle the rigors of med medical school and so on and so forth. And that's how they would determine whether or not they would want more information from you. And at that point, they would send out the secondary application. The secondary application fee for us is $65. However, if you qualify for the ACOMAS fee waiver, um, the, the secondary application fee can be waived. We also require the CASPER exam, and the secondary deadline is generally about two weeks after receipt of the secondary, but it's not a hard deadline. Um, for the, our interview process, we do offer uh, online virtual interviews and we do a panel style interview where you can be interviewed by one to three different interviewees uh, mixed between faculty and current students and as well as a multiple mini interview where you're given a, um, a situation or a, a role to play and then you would have to role play that situation out. Sorry, I know I'm running out of time here. <laughs> um, so these are our competitive class stats. The majority of it does not really pertain to the application, but I do want you to look at our average science GPA as well as our average MCAT. 
Um, we generally hover around a 3.6 to 3.7 for the science GPA, as well as a 509 for the MCAT. However, if you find that you do not meet our competitive average, that's absolutely fine. We don't have minimums. We don't like to assign certain numbers or anything like that to our applicants. So even though you don't meet our competitive average, I would still encourage you to reach out to me. I will uh, set up an advising session and we'll, we can see how we can better improve your application um, in order to put your best foot forward, even if you don't meet our competitive average. Oh, sorry, the slide didn't even advance. <laughs> Um, but yes, those are our competitive uh, stats right there. Um, because of our holistic approach to reviewing our applicants, we do take everything into consideration with whether it's your GPA and MCAT, your clinical exposure, community exposure, or leadership roles that you have taken in the past. So again, as I said, if you haven't met our competitive average as far as your academics, other aspects of your application can for sure miss, make up for um, any shortcomings in your uh, academics. And if you feel that you are not competitive enough for the osteopathic medicine program, we do have a lot of other different programs. As I said before, I am the counselor as well for the doctor of podiatric medicine program, uh, which is one of our uh, very, very good doctorate programs as well that studies more of the foot and ankle, as well as doctor of optometry and, and a whole lot of other um, programs that we offer, which are shown on our prospective student webpage. And here is my contact information. So if you want to reach out to me, if you have any questions at all, please do not hesitate to set up an advising appointment with me or just, you know, shoot me a phone call and then we can chit chat. Um, but if you have any general questions or anything like that, feel free to let me know today. And thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you for staying on time. I really appreciate it. I hope you feel better. Thank you. And if students, you have questions about Western University's program, feel free to put it in the chat or Q&A um, or, um, you know, raise your hand and we can maybe answer that live after our next presentation so we can stay on time. So Pacific Northwest University of Health Sciences will be represented by Dr. Jayola and Andy Shank. So feel free to take it over. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here to present uh, about uh, Pacific Northwest University. Here with me, I have uh, Andy Shank, the vice president of the students. Really. And I will be starting with Andy. Um, I would like Andy to kickstart off this uh, discussion because we are still focused today. So I'd like Andy to talk about what actually makes you to come to PNWA and what's uh, your student experience so far. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was uh, fortunate to be able to attend the Masters of Arts in Medical Science program that was previously at the Heritage University, but is now offered through PNWU. Um, through that program, you get to interact and take the same classes as the comm students, so the DO students. Um, so you meet the faculty, you talk to the faculty, you basically do the same thing that they do, and you get to kind of try out being a doctor um, or uh, a DO student. Um, and through that program, I got to learn and really immerse into how PNWU uh, interacts, uh, both with the students, with the faculty, and the administration. Um, so here, there's a real focus on giving back to the community, uh, on our mission and our values. And also here, uh, everyone, it's not a competitive environment, right? We, we work together to get through what can be a very challenging uh, course or, or program or the next exam. So we are very collaborative here. We are what we, what was stressed by one of the former students was that um, everyone here acts like a family member. And you, so we reach out to each other when we're having a difficult time. And so this was very appealing to me. Um, after going on interviews at other schools, it was very obvious that PNWU is different in that aspect, that um, even though we are all busy with our own um, challenges and, and, and 
things that we work on, um, we will always take the time out to listen to someone, uh, a classmate, um, or a faculty will listen to you talk about uh, what is going on in your life and make sure that you are able to succeed in whatever you pursue. Um, so that, that's what brought me to PNWU and I'm happy to talk more about it um, and our, our specific curriculum and stuff like that, but um, I'll hand it back to Emmanuel. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. And I'll provide some background about PNWU and uh, we'll come back to you again. So I'd like to share my screen. Um, yes, Pacific Northwest University of Health Sciences is located in Yakima, Washington State. Uh, and it was opened in 2005, only for TO, but now we have uh, more programs, physical therapy, professional therapy, and we'll be starting a dental program in uh, 2005. KNWU has its initial focus college, uh, and our mission is to train and educate staff care professionals of sizing service among rural and medically inside communities throughout the Northwest. And I'll talk more about this in a moment. And the world vision is to revolutionize community health. So uh, we have partners, like Andy said, Andy came through the master program and we collaborate with that. And that's one of the pathways we have student coming in, or those who want to go and do some other things, maybe physical therapy, maybe um, to, to, to proceed with another field of um, health. Um, we also collaborate with the USU, Washington State University College of Pharmacy, and also College of Nursing. So our prayer to sites for DU program is generally like the other ones, but especially because we're talking about uh, DU program, English college history will be English composition and literature, general chemistry, the like chemistry and physical and physics and biological sciences. Um, our geo program is four years of other programs. Um, and uh, knowing about geo, geo are trained to look at the old person from their first day of medical school, which means they see each person as more than just a collection of organ and body parts that may be injured. They approach uh, patients with a mystic in a holistic way and learn how to integrate the patient into healthcare process as a partner. And also, they are trained to communicate with people from diverse backgrounds, and they have opportunity to practice this skill in their classroom, learning and laboratories with SP. We have a highly furnished and functional standardized patient uh, laboratory where the students practice as far as, well as they come into the school. We have OPP lab where they practice their OMT. And uh, I'll come to talk about the our catchment area because we service mostly Pacific Northwest area. And that does not say that we do not get students from different other parts of the country. But our mission is focused on medically underserved area, rural community, and those who have gathered experiences or who live in rural area. We want to really want to reach out and revolutionize health in the rural area. So our tuition is also for, if we don't have in-state or, or outstate tuition, it's the same for everyone and it's reviewed uh, periodically. Requirements to our, our program, minimum requirements. This is a, you must be 18 by the time you are matriculating. You must be a citizen of the United States. We do not do international students. Applicants must have a bachelor's degree, or either master's or two doctoral degree from a regionally accredited university or college. MCATs um, must be a required um, part of a um, uh, process. And you must be sent to e-commerce and it must be valid for three years from the date of test by the time you are matriculating for the uh, program. 
Uh, other requirements, as I mentioned, six semester or nine, um, nine hours of credits for English. General chemistry must always be eight, eight semester or 12, 12 college hours. Uh, the organic chemistry as well should be eight hours. Physics should be eight, eight semesters. And the biological sciences should be 12 semesters or 18 hours of uh, the, the, the color system. We are open, to, we have a financial aid for our students. And uh, this is uh, the come to our uh, financial aid um, website. And you can get all the information that you need or get across to us. We will let you know. They, so they have some other sources of funding, like a federal and subsidized and graduate plus loans, service scholarship, uh, scholarship for veterans, and all the other ones. Um, application, our application process just like every other one, we go through the e-commerce and we put in May every year. Uh, we start collecting this data as early as June and supplemental notification goes out in July. Uh, we check your MCAT scores and the letter of recommendation. We, so we encourage our applicants to give more time to, to, to start this on time. So more people, you can have enough time to get this letter of recommendation in time. We Pay, we place a lot of emphasis on letter of recommendation here, and as much as possible, we, uh, we are also flexible, and we also uh, treat every case according to the merit. Uh, letter of recommendation, one from the DO or MD, one from your science faculty, and uh, one from your advisor. So we have we we'll go do a rolling admission, and we we'll do interview and we start in this September. We're already starting the study for the next session, for the next quarter that will be in, uh, matriculating in 2023. Um, I will turn over to Andy to talk more about the student support program that we have, both in academic and, uh, and in, in life generally. Andy. Yeah, so um, there's a lot that we do for support. We have a great support department, uh, what we call student success. And so one of the things that uh, I think is very beneficial is that we have a little doc, big doc program where um, you will be paired up with a upperclassman um, who kind of will mentor you and give you guidance on how to take exams, how to prepare for the material, how to, um, what to look out for and um, how to study for each of the professors. Uh, additionally, there's tutoring that's available for everybody um, for all the classes, either individual or group tutoring. And these are going to be students who excelled in the course. And then they're coming back to take time out of their busy days to help you and uh, teach you what they learned and how they got through the materials. Um, additionally, there's um, there's a additional uh, learning, learning specialist that can talk to you about uh, how to uh, com talk, how to learn, and you know work with you on the different ways that each one of us learns differently, and different um, methods to kind of accommodate your your specific learning style. There's also a robust accommodation system where, that you can apply for um, additional assistance during exams, during different ways, um, different labs, and stuff like that. And um, we also have a pretty pretty robust um, upper um, student government that will that you can reach out to for additional guidance. Um, and then our student affairs office will do a lot of residency planning. Um, we have a really robust graduate medical education office that um, reaches out to all the local residencies and are, is working on expanding residency opportunities for um, the students who graduate from Washington in the, the Whammy area. Uh, there's a lot of overlap in kind of our coverage area as far as the site selection. Um, so where we do our rotations uh, between University of Washington, us and Washington State University. Um, so those are actually really great areas where you might be able to work and learn with other medical students. Um, but then we also do have very remote locations where you get a lot of autonomy in where you, in how you learn and uh, where you do your clinical uh, sites. And so those have always had great feedback. Um, lastly, as a, as a nonprofit school, um, we do a lot of community outreach. So uh, you have a lot of opportunities to get out into the community and actually work with students, work with 
kids, um, work with other professions. Um, like Emmanuel said, we have a uh, PT program here at the school. Uh, we are opening up an OT program uh, and a dental program. Uh, and then we also have WSU's pharmacy program and nursing program. So we work with them and study with them on a lot of interprofessional education uh, objectives. And um, yeah, so um, we've been here for a while. So you know, getting loans and different payment strategies is not not very difficult, and we have a lot of resources and experience in, in your upperclassmen uh, to help you with that. Well, thank you so much. And if you are interested, if any students are interested in, in, in research, we have an Office of uh, Scholarly Activities who coordinates research, and they give, it, they give them a lot of support while doing that. I would like to talk a little bit about um, our yeah, mission and more about learning activities. We have a lecture, the lectures are pre-recorded and some are going live. And we have faculty directed self-studies, scientific foundation interactive sessions, and clinical interactive learning sessions. Um, also, the, 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 the anatomy lab is a highly functional one, which is the best that I've ever seen ever in my, in my journey through this uh, um, medical service. And also we have, uh, the students have opportunity to go to the Union Gospel Mission Clinic where they assist and they help uh, rural people from the, the community and help them to, to and treat them. So all that direction and the, the, the guidance of the faculty. So uh, this it looks like a, a very kind of a program. The, the curriculum schematic for preclinic uh, come, comes to it. And also um, the complex level, I don't know how much of that because I'm not in this, in this field. I don't know if Andy has anything to say about that. Right, so um, we have a, a kind of a more modern curriculum where we cover the uh, the system blocks uh, as a whole. So we cover both the normal and abnormal physiology, pathology, um, and treatment plans um, for diseases in one go, uh, which prepares you a little bit more directly for the complex and the step um, board exams. Um, as most of you guys know, step and complex have gone to pass fail, uh, so there's um we have a pretty robust dedicated study time for both both your board exams and um as you come back from clinical rotations uh you will have additional time to study for your level two and step two uh, additionally um if you wanted additional time uh for scholarly activity and research and if you want some additional Resources, uh, if you're applying for uh, the more competitive specialties, there are scholar positions available. Um, we have a very, very robust, uh, probably one of the best anatomy programs in the country, um, where you do a longitude. So our first year, uh, you will do a longitudinal anatomy dissection lab. Uh, you'll be in there about three to four hours a week, um, working with uh, cadavers and actually getting to you know, feel and touch and see the tissues and structures, uh, which is great practice for when you get out into clinicals. Um, and so as a scholar, you will assist with that, kind of make sure that you give the proper lectures and guidance during those labs. And then the we have two additional positions as OPP scholars, uh, where you get to really learn uh, in depth the, the intricacies of osteopathic medicine and philosophy. Um, and so those four positions allow you additional dedicated time to really beef up your resume, um, uh, add a lot of publications to, to your CV and make connections uh, at conferences across the nation. So. Uh, Thank you, Andy. And lastly, I'll show what it looks like our, our, test, our first time test cards in the PNW the on uh, versus the national to see how our first time taker test taker reads about we, we compare with the national test taker. 
to the written I and then also look at the rotation side location that we have it's spread all over and then we are having a good match. This is our match. Presidency uh, match rate. Matching with in the last few years, but we haven't got the, the latest of 2019. But so far, we have 98% match with the potential target. Uh, that will be all for now. Uh, we have any question. Unfortunately, we, uh, you, I have to pardon you if I'm not, I'm not giving you the much more of what you need because I am. I just came to represent who that has been designated to do this. Thank you for the audience and thank you, Andy, for joining me. With this. Thank you both for the great presentation. Thank you very much. Students, if you have questions, please make sure that you put it in the QA or the chat and we're going to get to it. And last but not least, Jeanette. Um, is here to represent CHSU. It's a long name, so I'm going to let you get to it. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, CHSU, it is a, it's a mouthful. Uh, California Health Sciences University College of Osteopathic Medicine. That is who I am here to represent. I am the Director of Admissions, and I know we are short on time, so I'm going to be quick, or I will try to be. Um, so, this is what students have told us why they choose CHSU, and, and I will go through each one of these on the following screens. Um, but we are right here in Clovis, California, kind of the dead center of the state um, near Fresno, if you know where that is. And, um, and we are, are here to serve the Central Valley. So that's basically our mission, um, recruiting students from here and around the area and, and the nation to help serve the underserved area of the Central Valley here that is in dire need of physicians. So our clerkships, which are your rotation sites, um, are all within an hour's or an hour and a half's drive of the school. Um, there are some that are about like two hours, like in Bakersfield, um, but for the most part, we try and keep everyone close so you don't have to relocate um, during your second year when you're also trying to study for boards and, and all of that. So um, it, it's a great way to, to serve the Valley because you're getting to stay right here and it helps um, you when it comes to monetary and uh, support and everything else because you're getting to stay right here where you've made those connections and, and made that support. I do also want to mention that we have QR codes at the bottom of every or most of the screen. So if you want more information about it, you can scan that with your phone as well. Um, we do team-based learning. So uh, it's not that scenario where you do all the work and your team gets all the credit. That's not how team-based learning works. Um, it's a very active learning environment where you can see everyone sits in groups or teams where you are working with, with those folks to really dive into the material that you're learning at that time. You get all of your materials ahead of time and then you come to class prepared and then you can really just, you know, dive in and really learn the material from all different walks of life, from all the different ways that people think on your team. Uh, and that really helps with you getting prepared to go out on rotations and everything as well, because you're thinking about things from lots of different angles because you've learned in that environment. We also have required medical Spanish. It's not required everywhere. And we do that because we are in an area that's 55% Hispanic speaking population. So we want our students to have at least an exposure to medical Spanish and, and be able to have those um, interactions with folks that may not speak English and still be able to uh, have a worthwhile conversation as it were, um, but also coming up with a diagnosis and being able to help that population as well. Another great opportunity we have is our early service learning opportunity. Um, we actually get students out into uh, clinics and, and areas around the um, community within their first uh, semester to go out and start doing these research projects that will last from their first year through their third year. Um, and they can just do one project or if they're really ambitious, they can do multiple projects. Uh, we had one of our first year students that did three uh, within their, their first uh, op the first year. So they're all population health research projects for students to learn about the population here in the Valley and to learn what 
what issue health um, issues are facing those here and what you'll likely see when you're out in the community as well. Many of these turn into capstone projects or posters that students can um, present at uh, our local uh, research day that we do here on campus every year, but also um, at regional and national events as well, and awards are, are available to students that do really well on those too. So um, it's great. It gets you out of the school, gets you, you know, in a different environment to kind of help decrease burnout as well to get you out in those early. One of the great things that we have here at CHSU is our technology. Because we are a new school, um, we have a lot of new gadgets and toys. Um, one of those is the butterfly handheld ultrasound that students start using in their first semester. Uh, it plugs into any smart device and you can start ultrasounding yourself, your friends, your family pets, <laughs> whoever, um, to get your practice on the, on the butterfly. We also have HoloLens, uh, the, the version two. So that is in development between Microsoft and Case Western Reserve um, as a way to uh, supplement anatomy learning to really decrease the time you have to, to spend on studying and everything because you have that, for, well, the time you have to spend on an anatomy lab or a, a cadaver lab so, because you have it at your fingertips at all times and you can study wherever you are, where if as long as you have a, a internet connection. So um, our students have said that that's one of the reasons that they come here because it's a really great tool to put in your toolkit um, that is gaining popularity uh, out there as well. We also are a little bit different because we include nutrition in our curriculum. Uh, we adopted the uh, Health Meets Food curriculum from Tulane University. And we built this beautiful teaching kitchen um, that came in handy during COVID because it was already set up with TVs and mics and cameras and all that kind of stuff. And our students learn, uh, depending on whatever body system they're talking about at that time, they learn about the nutrition side of that and how diet really affects different body systems as well. So they take those recipes, they share them, they get to cook together and share um, their meals, but then they take it back to their own families and help in that way. And eventually we'll be bringing in the community into the teaching kitchen as well to, to help educate the community as well. Our simulation center, we have not only the clinic side, but we have a uh, seven room hospital wing as well with our high fidelity mannequins that can talk, they can speak or well, same thing, they can speak to you, they can um, have, you can simulate all kinds of different health issues, uh, and then they blink and breathe and all of that. So um, you can see that you can have, you know, simulate the heartbeat and you can give them heart attacks and they can give birth. We have a, a mother baby birthing suite as well as a neonatal um, room as well. So a lot of different things that, that go into our simulation center um, and it's kind of our, our crown jewel here. It's a very large um, part of our building. It also includes a nurse's station, scrub room and charting stations for students to get practice on that as well. Here you can see some of our statistics. These are on our website, so you can feel free to dive into those a little bit more, but it does show that we have a very diverse group of students um, that, you know, diversity of thought, diversity of background, diversity of, of culture and everything else that we like to, to bring to our institution um, so our students get the best well-rounded education as it relates to um, having that diverse group. For our admissions requirements, we do require a bachelor's degree. Um, our overall and science GPA will need to be a 3.0 or better. I will say if you are close and you have done additional work that, that might bolster your application, we will still look at it. Um, it doesn't guarantee that you'll move forward, but that those are our minimums to, to move forward. Um, right off the bat in, in the admissions process. We do require two letters of recommendation and then an MCAT of 498 or above with no subsections below the 15th percentile. So you can have a 504 and still have a section below the 15th percentile. So do keep that in mind when you're looking at that. Additionally, um, there's some additional classes you can take. These are our prerequisites. Uh, they do need to be a C or better. We do not accept C minus and we only take pass fail within the time of COVID. Um, so uh, anything before that, uh, we, we don't accept. Must be within the 10 years of matriculation, the matriculation date, and we do accept AP credits. Um, and just know that you can apply before 
you've gotten your degree. You just need to make sure that all of that has been conferred before you start the program. Many students ask us how they can be a stronger candidate. These are four ways that you can do that. Um, having any kind of healthcare experience, if you have specifically, if you're interested in being a DO, make sure that you mention that in your application because they want to know that that's, that's the case. Um, so a passion for osteopathic medicine. If you do any kind of volunteering or service to your community, make sure you put that in your application and then any research or scholarly activities as well. I tried to be as quick as possible. Um, this last QR code is if you want to be on our interest list, feel free, you can scan that. I will also include, I have a whole list of, um, of links here, if it will, that I can, I can share outside of this um, with the, the folks at the Career Center, um, if anyone is interested, or you can email at us at comadmissions at chsu.edu, com admissions at chsu.edu. And we'd be happy to answer any questions you have or set up an advising appointment. You can also do that by joining our interest list as well. Um, and that's it for me. So thank you guys for listening and hopefully you'll reach out and, and get in touch with us um, for whatever it is that you, that you need and support and we're here to help you. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much for uh, keeping us on time and for the presentation. It's amazing that we actually concluded one minute early. So I'm gonna stop recording.